Okay, welcome everyone. So glad you could join us. Really great to see such a large turnout today, uh, both in person and online. Uh, hello online folks. Uh, so yeah, really delighted to have Casper over from uh, Copenhagen visiting us. And he's going to talk about uh, troubles with theory in HCI. So over to you, Casper. Looking forward to this. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. And uh, thanks for showing up. So basically, uh, for the, I don't know, last handful of years, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, theory in HCI, its role, how we use and engage with theory, and, and uh, a lot about uh, also what I consider the, the issues with theory we use in, in HCI currently. So I want to, uh, I want to express some of that uh, thinking. It's very much uh, work in progress, and also given sort of the scope of what I've talked about, I guess a little bit rantish. So, so uh, feel free to interrupt or save uh, criticism to end uh, as you as you as you like. Um, I guess I'm mostly talking about theory in relation to research. That's what I do and know about. So there's a whole separate issue of uh, of uh, theory use in practice that I won't cover. And um, otherwise, I guess let's get let's get going. So that's the that's the intention today. So. Uh, I guess you sort of feel like you should start by saying something about what theory is. You could say that's from Greek, right? Theory, right? and but somehow related to theater, about looking, uh, being a spectator, uh, finding uh, uh, things in perception to uh, to attend to. Um, I kind of like this uh, this uh, definition of uh, of theory as a starting point, so that we don't spend all our our time on just agreeing on a definition, namely that theory is a statement of concepts, their interrelationship that show how uh, and or why a phenomena uh, occurs. And that's, I kind of intended as a neutral starting starting ground, no need to uh, to battle uh, um, uh, yet. Another very sort of instrumental way of thinking about uh, theory is by Wetton that I also kind of like. He wrote it as an editorial in the Academy of Management uh, Review, a very nice journal, if you don't know it, uh, because he was just like so upset about people claiming to do theory and not really doing theory. And he he thought that a theoretical uh, contribution should have at least those components that should say something about what saw, I guess we call that the concepts, uh, building blocks. Uh, it should say something about how those building blocks uh, relate. It should definitely say something about why they relate in the way that's claimed under the how, and then perhaps something about the conditions who and where those building blocks relate or don't relate or play out in a particular way or don't play out in a particular way. In, uh, in HCI, that has been sort of the similar ideas about theory has been uh, pursued. So in Steinemann and Plessant's uh, textbook, an earlier version of that, they, they said that a goal for the discipline of HCI is to go beyond the specifics of guidelines and build on the breadth of principles to develop tested, reliable, and broadly useful theories. So somehow an ambition for HCI to actually do something that is beyond a particular and specific situation. Um, other people have pursued uh, a similar interest in, in, uh, in theory. So Jeff Carroll, and of course, you know, Yvonne Rogers have written extensively about different varieties of of theories in, in HCI. I would say in general, the ambition here is, uh, is very similar to go beyond uh, phenomena to something that can be applied across many different uh, settings and many different types of interactive systems. Um, like a bit more specifically, if you think about what would be a theory for different people in HCI, I think this is a, this is a, a list of uh, top scorers from an in-depth analysis that I will talk a bit about uh, in a moment. Kai, uh, in Kai in general, but in particular, this is from Kai 2021. Those are sort of the, the theories that people uh, use when they claim to be using a theory. So self-determination theory, activity theory, behavior change theory, some aesthetic design, flow theory, and so on. So what people in, in general think about uh, the, the uses of theory, I think this is the last what is theory kind of lecturing slide I'll have, so bear with me, uh, is, is typically two big uh, set of, uh, of functions. 
that's from two books I happen to very much like. That's not about theory and HCI, but in, in general, Robert Dubin and um, Paul Reynolds. And that is on the one side to, to predict or foresee uh, outcomes of, uh, of uh, behavior. And then the other uh, big use is to understand uh, the mechanisms or the processes or what I call whys on the previous slide uh, involved in behaviors and in behaviors with interactive uh, systems. Of course, then, like if we just like somehow need to get going, there's a whole other range of uses of theories that you can debate whether it's uh, subsumed over these two general categories or, or not. So people sometimes think, talk about sensitizing concepts. So basically uh, concepts that allow you to pay attention to or notice certain things. People will talk about taxonomies and there's huge debates over whether a taxonomy is a full theory or some sort of partial version of a theory. And then, um, of course, we are, I guess, in HI interested often in designing interactive systems, and people have very different views on the role of theory in, in, in doing that. And I guess, in particular, if, if that is the same use as predicting the behavior of design as something else. So, uh, so the point I wanted to make with all of this is that I think given this hopefully relatively uncontroversial view of theory in HCI, there's a number of troubles in HCI with, with theory. And actually, when, when you begin to do that list, it's a little bit depressing because I don't think we have theory in the senses I just talked about. I don't think that HCI researchers necessarily want theory and there's explicit examples of people I'll give you that don't want it. I don't think we use theory very well in HCI. I don't think we design with theory, and I don't think we we test theory in the way that people do it in other fields. And and as I said, this was sort of a sweeping general uh, general rant about uh, theory. So let me try to dive into uh, these points and make it a little more uh, perhaps persuasive. Um, the first. Uh, I guess trouble is that that you would think somehow that in uh, in um, HCI there's something very distinct about interactive behavior, uh, interacting with uh, technology and complex interactive uh, uh, systems. So so you could expect somehow that one of the things that would have happened in HCI since from whenever we begin counting uh, 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 that we would have produced those theories that account from for interactive behavior. And I don't actually think that's uh, the, the case to a very large extent. So first of all, you could think that we would have a theory of usability, right? That somehow we had established basically what makes an interactive system good uh, and have uh, some of the mechanisms like the one I talked about that we can predict, that we understand what makes systems usable and what does make uh, systems usable. And basically, at least if I look at the literature, as I said, you feel free to disagree now if it's too much or later, if it's if it's tolerable, I think the current literature on usability uh, have uh, nice taxonomies of different aspects of usability. That's the idea in both the uh, ESO definition of usability and in Nielsen's usability engineering thing, but those are just taxonomies. So basically it gives us, uh, in ESO's case, there are three orthogonal probably aspects of usability and that's it. It doesn't give us much more uh, somehow to reason with about usability and it definitely doesn't give us anything like a, a, an understanding of why usability uh, happens with an interactive system or why it doesn't. I think the strongest uh, argument uh, for that view is made by Norm Praktinsky a couple of years ago uh, in a paper that's uh, very nice, you should look it up if you don't know it, where he tried to play with the idea that the usability construct has been a dead end for, for AT. HCI, and he sort of uh, says that, that uh, okay, you can read it, but I'll paraphrase that the problem with usability uh, as a construct is that it's an umbrella construct. It subsumes very, very different things, subjective satisfaction, error rates, to give two examples. And that somehow has, without us noticing, uh, made it impossible to actually make proper progress on usability, on questions like the mechanisms or the interrelations among different aspects of usability. I think that's a super uh, persuasive uh, argument and somehow I think we have those things about usability, but not much more. 
You could also think that then at least we would have, since it's called HI, a proper theory of uh, interaction that would say something about what interaction is, how it develops, what the mechanisms involved in interaction is. And already in, in 1990, uh, Terry Winograd in a keynote at uh, Kai, I think, uh, asked uh, somehow uh, what it is that we really mean by interaction. So obviously interaction is something like mutual or reciprocal action or influence. And that's like, once you understood that, what else do we know about uh, interaction? How does that reciprocal action develop? What are the dimensions of it? And uh, a couple of years ago with, uh, with anti that we tried to make sense of what is our current understanding of interaction in ATI. And uh, I think we came up with seven completely different ways of understanding interaction with no obvious uh, interplay between them that we somehow uh, felt like it was okay to write, that we, we we have work on interaction, but our basic understanding of interaction as a construct is surprisingly confused. So that's just two examples of where I think we could have theory in HCI where we seem to not have it. Um, I think you mentioned that this uh, uh, view of, uh, of issues in HCI, Duncan. So a couple of uh, years ago, you at Ella Tai and Kostakis and Interaction made this argument that HCI lacked motor themes. So I guess a motor theme is sort of defined in this in this uh, graph theoretical sense where you have um, you have two uh, dimensions. If you imagine papers, in this case given by the keywords clustered, right? So you have uh, a, a dimension which is about how central to uh, HCI. Uh, a, a paper's topic is, and you would have somehow uh, an axis which is about how dense, how much work is on that uh, topic. And uh, what uh, Kostakis argued in the intersections papers is that um, that basically HCI don't have many of those uh, motor themes, things that are both high in density, we work a lot on it, and central, that is that other, people, other parts of HCI tend to refer back to those papers. In my view, this, this lack of motor themes is actually about lacking a common set of agreed upon theories, uh, constructs, and uh, interrelation among constructs that we are interested in studying across papers. A similar uh, argument, I think, for the absence of theories in HI is that we don't do very many replications. So we tend to do a lot of new technology uh, look at interesting use use situations, but very few replications. So you could look at that in different ways. There was a replica initiative at Kai that sort of came and then it went away. I don't know what happened in the meantime, but not very much. And when we looked at a sample of 891 Kai papers, uh, we found that just 3% of them actually replicated earlier work. And, and in sort of, I don't know, theory about replication, there's this idea that you can have conceptual replications where you keep the essential links between constructs, but maybe you measure them in different ways. Maybe you measure them in slightly different settings. And that's essentially testing whether a theory is robust to that variations in settings and in particular ways of measuring things. And we seem to do that very rarely. So, so all of this means that I think we could have theory. I don't think we have very, uh, very much one reason could be that we actually don't want theory. Uh, so for uh, I, I'll come give you a couple of arguments that I see in the literature where people seem to be arguing against, against theory use. And you can, again, uh, just shout if it's too much. So one, one uh, sort of funny idea is that if we just iterate, if we just do user-centered design, everything will turn out well. Um, this uh, paper, Landauer, 1991, in a, in a collection of essays on HCI at the time, uh, it was, I think I used to think of it as my favorite HCI paper. So basically, the argument was that all of this idea of using psychology, like in the 90s, it's just, it's a dead end. We should just uh, acknowledge that we can do much less with psychological theory than we believe we could. And therefore, we need to rely on empirical measures and, and iteration. And, um, and I think 
in, in that way, why should we even bother with theory uh, if we can iterate or now if we can do A-B testing or in other ways can just uh, somehow uh, obtain empirical uh, uh, evidence, empirical data about the things we want to uh, uh, somehow design or the, the things we think about about a particular system. Why shouldn't we just do that instead of instead of uh, using theory and going through all kind of elaborate thinking? And I think that uh, that's actually a surprisingly common uh, view. I think in papers when I looked at them that we just let's just do something and test it and then. Uh, 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 nature, social reality, or whatever you think will teach us whether we are wrong or not, right. There's another variant of this, which, uh, which, uh, which uh, now I call it the inductive hamster wheel. And the idea here is that in, um, so this is all based on analysis of introduction to chi papers. There is a type of introduction that I'm sure you, you can recognize in a way, but it goes something like, we have this new situation uh, a new user group, a new use situation, a new technology, or maybe even a combination of all of those. And and it's fairly obvious we don't know anything about that new combination. And we also believe that all the stuff we already know somehow don't apply. We don't need to think with that uh, set of theories or that uh, knowledge. In this new situation, we should just study it. And I think when you think in that way, um, then uh, it's very attractive to do uh, grounded theory, bottom-up studies, exploratory studies, or something like that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that in a way, but of course it's also an argument against not using theory, right? So papers that start this way will typically not uh, show that a particular theory might or might not apply to this situation. It will just argue that we have a new situation, let's study it. And then in some way we are sort of stuck in doing studies and studies and studies and not necessarily uh, consolidating those or making them speak very intensively with each other. This is just a final uh, sort of reason why we don't want to engage with theory, which I think is most prominently expressed by, uh, by Phil Gaber. And he has this uh, argument that uh, for, um, it was specifically about research through design, but I think it, it somehow is more is valid more generally for HCI that uh, the, the theory in uh, relation to design can not do very much for us. We can have it as an aspiration or sort of very proficient uh, provisional uh, uh, resource in design, but in reality, theory will only somehow emerge bottom up as annotations or constructions. Uh, on top of design practice. That's why he uh, uh, proposed stuff like portfolios to generate theory that way. But that also means that we don't actually start with theory, we start by design and then we might create theory along the way. I think that's that's another reason why people don't engage with theory particularly much in, in, uh, in HCI. The third kind of issue is that Okay, let's, even if we ignore the two first troubles, is I think people uh, don't necessarily use theory uh, a lot in papers. So this is based on, on, I guess, almost like it felt like it was the COVID start project is not done uh, with these two research assistants, Harold and, and Olga. We had the idea that we want to look at all high papers and how they use theory. And maybe that was sort of post-COVID a slightly optimistic uh, project. At least it's still going on. But the basic idea is we, we looked at uh, that old uh, papers published at uh, CHI when we started, and then we try to figure out which of those used, uh, used theory. So basically what I'm about to say is based on this, uh, on this uh, uh, corpus, and because it's not published, you sort of need to trust me for now. And, and the most, two most prominent uses of theory uh, is uh, as follows. So one of them is theory use as background. It's sort of, very paper close. So this is actually quotes from introduction of papers. And they would say uh, uh, something about theory in the beginning of uh, papers. So in this case, we draw from interaction design theory to consider designing as a process that does not end with the designers themselves. So there's all kinds of questions here, but let's just, this is an example of theory used as background. 
Uh, there's another example here that they've been reading on chaos, exposed humanism and ecofeminism to find ideas for what uh, what they are challenging in this particular paper. So uh, sweeping generalization, we have a lot of those uh, draw from, inspired by, building on, reading from, which is a super informal uh, way of using theory. It does very little uh, as sort of you can like, like there's very little intellectual work that you can detect in papers about what it like what is actually being drawn from here, how is it being used from. They have been reading this, that's all very fine, but what exactly is it that they use? If we think back to the the definition of theory, which constructs do they take? What are the interrelations among those constructs that they somehow bring to work in in this in, in this uh, piece? Um, so, so in my head, it like if you are very unkind to at least some of these uh, ways of using theory, it's a kind of a theoretical power posing, uh, and some of that might be justified and useful. But in in these and similar cases, you use theory to show sort of where in the intellectual landscape you you are. You can show intellectual heri heritage, but you don't actually do very much. A sort of explicit reasoning in the paper from those theories. Uh, similarly, an unkind interpretation, which I, I think is right for some of these papers, is that that this use of theory is, uh, is essentially an identity. Julia Galef calls it a soldier mindset, which I kind of like. So you put out you put out theories and positions, and those are the hills that you're willing to die on. You're not. You're not. Uh, you're not exploring. You're not potentially finding issues with. You are. You are. You are posing, and therefore you are also not uh, freely exploring which part of this theory that might be uh, that might be wrong. Again, I just think this is a the examples like this is a very peculiar way of using theory because I don't actually get any sense. With the theory they are thinking with. Three is that you put it at the end of the paper. In the end, you say something like this might be unsurprising given that the theory of planned behavior lists social norms as one of the three main factors in decision making, which is all nice. Or you could say, this is consistent with social penetration theory, ionization and straighten. Uh, both of those are, are in principle uh, in principle fine. Um, again, we can sort of note that it's uh, it's uh, unsurprising giving that. So this is authors that actually have done a full empirical study and then find somehow in the end that it's unsurprising uh, or that it's consistent with. Of course, there's an endless a number of theories that a particular empirical finding is consistent with. So, uh, so in this way, um, some of us that learn to speak uh, or write, in particular English as a second language, are always uh, thrown uh, has always thrown strong and wide on us, uh, right? To learn to to write well, and in that there's this idea that you can say secondly because Lee is like putting a hat on a horse. And I always that somehow stuck with me. And I think some of this uh, theory only in the discussion is a bit like putting a head on a horse. You have your design, you have your empirical data, and then in the end, you you have a relatively minor, uh, almost an afterthought with the with the theory, and note that it's that it's consistent with or it's unsurprising giving uh, that. So uh, often you don't have upfront work with this theory, you don't have predictions from it, you don't have any explanations of possible mechanisms from the theory, and, and you don't have some sort of talk back to the theory, maybe you didn't understand it, or maybe you made assumptions along the way that clash with the theory. It's, it's this afterthought. I think, I think this is, these two points are sort of, are sort of known to be a bigger issue in uh, in HCI. Uh, Marshall and uh, the colleagues did a nice citation analysis in HCI just to look at when people cite stuff, what do they do with a citation? And then they found that that uh, most of the time, 
uh, citations were were presented as an uncontested uh, uh, fact in uh, like forty three percent of these or sort of Kaya papers. There were sort of citations to stuff, including to theory that was just presented but not really engaged with. Uh, uh, Elisa Meckler and Abel Tayek has shown for self-determination theory that even though that's often invoked and talked about as a theory in the ways I talk about, uh, it's not actually used in very deep ways. So self-determination theory has many theories that are in most of the papers they surveyed not put to any use. So it's a little bit uh, ceremonial to uh, to use this theory when you don't actually engage with the, with the bread and butter of the theory. Um, Colin Gray and a colleague showed that for Shawin uh, Brazil's uh, classic paper on feminist HCI, there was sort of a similar type of citation patterns that uh, that that paper was cited, but it wasn't actually used for much beyond the citation. So all of this is, I think, uh, evidence, or I don't know what circumstantial evidence or whatever you call it, that uh, even when we do use theory in HCI, we don't do so in a very, very deep way. Uh, okay, and it actually it gets worse, I think. So, uh, so I don't think also if you try to uh, identify in constructive HCI work how people use uh, theories in design, I don't think you find uh, much sort of actual use there. So, uh, so this is uh, from the CHI twenty twenty one papers. Uh, sample I showed you before. So a lot of the papers that both construct things and do um, have uh, have some sort of theory used, they will often do it like we include this functionality because of like self-determination uh, need for autonomy, uh, or we will have some uh, visualization design inspired by Tuxedo's minimalist theory for effective information visualization. So in uh, those cases, like they actually don't happen very often. And and uh, typically the pattern in justification is like that. So it's like whole systems that are justified on a theory. And of course, there's an endless possibility from a theory to actual system features um, that are not uh, spelled out or even explained with, with uh, a theory. It's mainly at the system levels, this type of explanation is done. So that make, means that it's very difficult to trace the link from decisions about functionality of features back to the, the, the theory. With anti as we, we try to do a, a, a deep dive into theory for, for uh, designing systems by looking at uh, very detailed, the last slide was not very detailed, this was very detailed, about best papers from CHI 20, uh, uh, 20, uh, 27. Uh, and uh, 17. And then uh, the idea was to simply look at how uh, those papers uh, both did construction and what roles theory played in that construction. So uh, out of the 24, uh, five, uh, 17 were about constructing uh, technology. So we analyzed those. And in those papers, we, we do find that there's sort of a discernible mention of theory in nine of them. Sometimes that would be, uh, this is example Jan Guggenheimer's work who said something like, like, um, like draw on prior work that showed that physical interaction can potentially increase enjoyment, social interaction and has social uh, cognitive benefits, but without going into more detail about this particular theory. Uh, it, in fact, this happens only in the related work or introduction section. Uh, eight of them uh, talks uh, in other sections of the paper about theory. And just two of them actually actively draw on uh, on uh, theory. So, so this was a, 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 a paper that draw on direct manipulation and sort of associated uh, ideas about distributed cognition to do a, a manual practice training system. And this was a a paper that uh, was some information visualization draw on uh, ideas about the benefits of articulating a belief before you, you see it in the visualization. So I guess for, for us, it was sort of a little interesting that, okay, let's say uh, 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 less than 10% of the papers in HCI uh, in, in 
just sort of the minimal way you theory and are uh, directed by uh, theory. It's not, I don't mind uh, at all uh, constructive papers that need theory. Three don't need to be uh, to be a nervous, but you would, I guess I would have assumed a priori that more than 10% of the papers actually somehow drew on, on something that we had formulated generally applicable idea of. Okay, so the last thing is, I, I guess it's about also somehow the fact that yeah, not only do we have all the troubles I just talked about, we also uh, don't really develop and, and test theory. Uh, and I guess I already somehow hinted at the, that effect. If we don't want to use it, we certainly don't develop and test it, uh, and test it either. And I think uh, I, there's a, for those of you who, that are from psychology, there was a very funky paper, I think, uh, published by Nasheel, who, who basically argued or had tried to make the argument that that most psychological findings are not even wrong. And I thought there was a it was a super uh, uh, interesting uh, paper because uh, it it had this idea that most claims in the published literature on psychology are somehow so critically underspecified. That's her, her words, not mine. That that if you attempt to empirically evaluate them, you're doomed to failure because they are somehow at a level of generality where they, they are not even wrong. And you need to do so many so much work to get them to a way where they inform design or they form empirical studies that, that, that you can go wrong like in hundreds of ways in, in that, in, in that uh, moving along. And I think it's very fun, interesting to think about for HI theories or models or frameworks. I don't care for me, that's all, that's all kind of theory. Like, uh, like which of them says something substantially strong that you can actually uh, find something in them that you can empirically test and 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 disagree with. We have it seems to me that there's something in this. We have a lot of of models of frameworks that like usability uh, is at a level of generality where it's somehow very difficult to tease uh, anything out of them that are. Uh, that you can take and disagree with an empirical, empirical uh, study. So one one of my favorite like old uh, old um, writers about uh, philosophy in science in 1964, where he sort of imagined that science would be you you're doing this, you are walking past right, and sometimes you would be at a, a crossroads and you would actually not know. Like you could do all the literature search you would you would want to do and all the theories and you would be generally not getting which which way to to go so that's where you do an empirical uh, study right and and the, you have al alternative hypotheses that are equally possible and then you you do empir empirical work to decide which way to uh, to do a theories and either you want to do that with, with uh, and actual studies that do that. So this is a this is another way to think about uh, about testing theory and about somehow having engagements with theory and uh, being able to speak back to theory. So so if this was a paper, how many of you have seen a paper that have an implications for theory section? Or it's not that bad. I mean, they're there, they're there. But we, we, when we do this coding of uh, Kai papers, it's actually much less uh, common than than you would uh, you would think. In contrast, and of course, this is sort of a pun on Paul Doris, uh, famous paper implications for design. He was actually grumpy about implications for design, but that's not uh, the point here. But then you will see many many papers that have that offers implications for how we should design systems, how we should guidelines for how to put them together, but not so much this kind of, uh, this kind of advice. And when we, when, we, when we did that studies, we found that we were, we were at that stage uh, not willing to code all of these papers that has changed, but at the stage where we did this coding, we took 100 of them and we found that um, 19 uh, of the 100 papers had some implications for theory section, 
it's it's fairly fuzzy to identify those because they're often not called that. Whereas uh, like 82% of the papers actually had this implication for design. So it's sort of interesting that we are very willing to do uh, that, but surprisingly unwilling to uh, engage with theory in a way that can somehow talk back to the to the theory. Okay, that was very long, uh, given my planning of this uh, of this talk, because there was supposed to be a a positive uh, a positive ending to this, but that's uh, main that's going to be a little short, but maybe that's fine. Um, so. Uh, so I guess what I'm doing at the moment is to somehow, I, I like to think about what would be an alternative take of theory, what would be the down to the earth, earth everyday things we should do to change this uh, picture if we are unsatisfied with it, uh, and what would be the sort of higher level considerations about what our jobs uh, are in a way that, that could lead this uh, thinking. So I'm a big fan of Robert Dubin. It's a, a very, very strange and absolutely wonderful book, uh, theory building, I think. And one of his points is that basically the job description of researchers is that you test theory. Like you might, and, and the sad truth is, of course, we do a lot of uh, other things. Some of them are fun, not so much. But in his view, that's the main, uh, that's the main uh, uh, job description. So whenever you're doing something that is not testing theory, I guess his advice and it's a little strong, but let's just play with it for, for fun. He's advises to think carefully about what on earth it is that you're doing if you're not testing a theory. So, so, uh, so this view, and I guess a lot of what I said with the troubles uh, along, uh, along this talk so far is that, that somehow we should just be able to throughout a research process in with the about the combination of X and the, uh, and Y, or we don't know nothing about this user group of social technology, or we know nothing about uh, what happens in VR when this and that. It becomes a little, a little uh, I think, uh, annoying and for some of those works I would really wish and uh, that there were much more reasoning with theory before people concluded there was a need for more empirical work. I would be perfectly happy with, with an argument like this if I had been stepped through what we already know about social media or VR and had a strong argument that this might not actually apply in the case we're talking about. I would somehow that that for me is completely different style of introduction, then, then we have this new combination and we are not sure uh, what happens in it. I think also, I guess, so So at least for me, the biggest revolution uh, in, in the part of science I'm in is uh, restricting uh, researchers' degrees of uh, freedom, uh, pre-registration in uh, registered reports, all kind of uh, initiatives uh, like that. So I think we can do a general version of that, which is much more carefully form expectation before uh, analysis. They could be, like you could imagine theoretical pre-registrations, not just like analysis plans and uh, stats, but actually uh, theoretical reason reasoning that was uh, kept intact independently of what your data showed. Um, Ruben has this idea of uh, a generalization of hacking, uh, hypothesis after results are uh, known. And, and, and uh, this R hacking is basically uh, retrieving theories that might fit what you get after you have gotten results from empirical data. And of course, he, he uh, warns against, uh, uh, against that. And I guess the couple of examples I showed you, this is consistent with social penetration theory. It's completely, it, it changes the world for me if that was uh, something that people were thinking about before doing a study, or if that was something people added because the discussion needed to be two pages and uh, there were some uh, theories that you wanted to say uh, your results were consistent with. I think that's just two different uh, functions of theory, one of uh, which I think is very important. I think the, the whole, uh, let's just uh, iterate uh, let's just do user-centered uh, uh, design argument. I think what that doesn't help us do is to think about 
uh, why constructs are related in a particular way. So if you, you can call it um, mechanistic explanations, right? Maybe we get prediction. We understand which design doesn't work and which design works, but we don't actually get ideas about why design works. And I think similarly to, um, to the other concerns I had about these Kai papers, there's a lot of papers that conclude that this design works. That's nice. But, but the speculation about why it works and which mechanisms that are causing it to work and maybe even uh, speculations prior to design about why a particular design was, would be working uh, just is there, I think, far too rarely. Uh, then I think this whole uh, both testing and being able to and interested in talking back to theory is, uh, is a very... Uh, Nice way to think about uh, uh, research in a recent paper with Nilsson Bergel. We like somehow listed a lot of implications for for um, for HCI research that individual papers might have, and uh, and one of them is implications for theory that somehow like we know stuff about constructs and how they relate. Why wouldn't we, for particular studies, talk back to uh, that? And of course, there's all kind of philosophy of science reasons why sort of Lekater style that, uh, of course, it's not like just because something don't work that's based on a theory, we reject the theory. I can't like like make quantum mechanics uh, fortified by kicking uh, something in a wrong way, right? It's much more complicated, of course, to do this derivation of ideas from a theory, but we could still try to talk uh, back somehow to theory. Um, yeah. Okay, I think I changed this reason. If it doesn't really make sense, I think the 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 idea that it should have said was that I think somehow daring to actually test theory to make predictions from what we already know and and uh, possibly also do that fleshing out work from from theory to individual designs or study results are are super important. There's uh, uh, also uh, for. Uh, there's also, I think, a need to just do much more modest lowercase c t theory building, which is uh, uh, equally fine. Maybe that's the bulk of of normal science somehow to uh, uh, to do that, which I think we do too too rarely. And then there's all this stuff with I think we should know something about like what is interaction, what is uh, user experience. I guess the best theory for that is probably Mark Hassenstahl's, and it's still completely unclear to me what the relation between hedonic and pragmatic quality is. I mean, I, I understand what he thinks it is, but what we know about that relation, uh, sorry, I think is very unclear. And then the last uh, last couple of things, maybe it's okay. Yeah. Um, the top one is about, I think this, uh, the bigger issue with posing with theory, adopting one theory and becoming almost one with is that is an analogy to methods. So I, I would assume that none of you believe that there is a correct method, right? Like somehow you pick methods so that they match the research problems. We all have favorites, but still we believe that you should pick that. So similar, like how, how can you think about theories in a way where you don't pick uh, among them, where you don't electively combine them, compare them, and in in other ways are sort of a pluralist about theories? That's very strange to me to uh, to understand. So I think it's it's very uh, important to just stop this uh, positioning identity unless you really want to flesh out what the substance of your your thinking with theory is. I think that would make it interest more interesting. And then I, if you think about it. Um, there are very, very, I can think of very few papers that actually in interesting ways compare theories or take uh, uh, explanations from a couple of uh, competing theories about a phenomena. It could be like whatever, emotion theories for particular uh, uh, phenomena and then uh, compare those and, and somehow uh, have a discussion among those, uh, those theories. It's super, uh, it's super rare and uh, maybe it's a bit like method triangulation. Everybody thinks that everybody should do it, but we don't want to be the person ourselves who needs to do that work. Maybe it's similar to that, but I think actually that is uh, some sort of pluralism about theory and some sort of comparison I think is very interesting. 
Then the last point, uh, I, I guess that was just because I saw faces on the on the corridor when I end that, and I just wanted to mention um, this book. But basically, a lot of what I'm criticizing is that theories supposedly have a lot of reasoning capabilities. It gives us ideas about, about how to think about phenomena, how they're related, and, and we seem to not very often use them. So that has been uh, nicely the point for self-determination theory has been made. Okay, it's it's uh, the basic idea is there are three types of needs. If you don't do anything else but three types of needs for self-determination theory, you just don't get very much of the good stuff in a way. So that was basically the argument of that paper. Uh, that book, Ikekaki's um, Measuring Emotion and Effect, I would say, makes the argument that whenever people just randomly take an emotion questionnaire uh, and don't with it take all the assumptions about uh, effect, whether it's dimensions or or discrete, for instance, then they miss uh, both. Both they actually can get in trouble for using that measuring tool, but they also miss all of the reasoning capability for, say, uh, for instance, about emotions, how they are uh, created, how appraisal occurs, uh, because they just use, I don't know, pen as something. Okay. I think that's it. I uh, Basically, I just wanted to complain about theory. We don't have it. We don't want it. We don't use it. We don't design with it. And we don't create it. And then somehow I think there's this positive idea. Uh, I, I intended to sound positive that there's actually another way of engaging with theory that I think would bring our field forward somehow. And, so, and I don't know. I, this is just a public commitment to uh, working on that for the next, I don't know, Five years in particular, if people will fund me, which doesn't seem to be the way. But uh, but I think that's somehow what I want to do and and think about both not only complain but actually do more examples of how give more examples of how you can uh, do this, how you can uh, develop theory, how you can use method structured measures to analyzing constructs and uncovering some of those mechanistic explanations of user interface. So um, that's. Uh, positive message. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And let me give you this. Speak to the shout. Have you just told us more about theory or about Kai? I all your examples have been taken from Kai and there's a huge space of other kinds of HCI publications that so, you know, I've got a whole pile of papers that use theory in ways that you might or might not approve of. That's not the point. Um, but then none of them is in Kai because they weren't going to be accepted for Kai. They're published elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think that's a super fair objection to the to the data somehow uh, that that uh, I have to a large extent uh, uh, looked at Kai and, and surely there's something about the conference format or the, the, the ability to give uh, explanations uh, that that might not work well at a conference. Um, I think that's um, that's true. Maybe I should do more of uh, like non-CHI examples. I guess my, so my response is, I think, so first of all, I think it's kind of depressing then if the, if, if you're somehow right that we have a, a, a flagship or major conference that selects against something we all think is important. That's all. But maybe that's a Kai problem, right? And not not a, a field problem. I think it, my feeling is, but as I said, you're right that I don't have data on that, is that for, for many other ATI outlets, it, there's, uh, there's patterns like this. I don't know if they are as pronounced as uh, at Kai, but I, I feel I see a lot of uh, Journal submissions. Uh, currently, I'm I'm co-editor of Tokai, and uh, and I think I see a lot of theory use that are similar to what's going on here. Uh, but but I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have sort of strong data on it. I guess I would also add that right now I'm in late stages of working on two papers that explicitly talk about the role of theory in design, it's been held to structure those papers in a way that actually gives a clear narrative through 
the different aspects of the design and how theory was used and how credit was or was not given to the theory in terms of what then happened as a consequence of using it in design. Just creating that narrative has been absolute hell. And I'm still not sure I've got it right, but you know, it's writing these kinds of, well, writing strong theory papers is incredibly hard. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's true. I know sometimes I think about there was this ambition in in uh, like design rational ambition in the I think mainly in the eighties and then it somehow seemed to decline, which was exactly to do somehow give justified reasons for particular design features. And I think you're right. It's 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 a lot of work. I think it's also super important and interesting if you want to claim that I don't know what you are current theory is, but if you want to claim that self-determination theory can some, somehow just feed the design to then actually show what the reasoning you need to do is and what all the intermediary steps and fleshing out of, I don't know, three uh, three needs into a design, what those uh, are. And I guess I think uh, it sounds like very nice uh, papers, but I think that reasoning is sort of annoying when that's hidden because it's actually very hard. So like, would, why why don't we share more of that reasoning? I'll let you review the FTC mm -hmm. paper. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to grab a quick question. That's okay. I couldn't help but uh, think throughout this uh, the, the process of research and what what was not said about it is how social it is, right? And I think it's hinted to in that that little section with the uh, we've been reading this stuff and just how tribal that is. It's either the authors are saying, "Look, this is the club I'm in." Or it's reviewer two saying, cite my paper. And it's like, you can quickly just tap it in. Um, and so I think it is a, like, the, why this stuff is there is, is, is about forming groups, right? It's social interaction. And critically going to your point there about testing theory, when, when you do that, it's, it's the opposite of making friends. It's te theory testing is often about starting fights and picking fights with people. And when, you know, the experience of doing that is it, uh, it's an uphill battle, you know, talk about hard work, it's hard work, right? Especially if you've got, you know, famous ex-professor who's built an entire career around their great theory and you're poking holes saying all the ways in which it doesn't replicate or doesn't generalize or doesn't doesn't do something. So it's, it's I wonder a little bit there about the kind of social processes and pressures, you know, you talk about the peer review process as well, like the operate in that space. A kind of question slash observation. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good question. I think one of the one of the HCI papers I really love is Graham Salzman, Damage Merchandise. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a uh, it's the most devastating takedown of uh, at that time existing uh, empirical studies of usability evaluation methods. It was not like in any way making friends. I'm I sort of no <laughs> for a fact, but it was just an incredible important paper. Uh, and yeah, sure. I mean. It, 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 I guess uh, I guess you are you're right, uh, and then I guess there's of course very important science that are not about making friends, but uh, but the, the opposite. So so I I I think this like of course there's I call it positioning. You can also say that there's a a, a useful function in shortcutting a lot of discussions by by stating explicitly sort of your allegiance and which fundamental ideas you have about. Uh, about um, about science, so that's a positive function also socially of of writing those things. Uh, I guess in particular when I read, and I've been forced to do that because of this uh, strange idea of of reading old Kai papers, right? When I read outside of areas of that I'm familiar with, it's incredibly unhelpful because all the all the reasoning with that theory isn't spelled out. Uh, I think it's possible to spell out. So the journals I I like a lot outside of HCI, I think manages to force authors to, you know, for example, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, for example, I'm a big fan, force to write uh, people in, okay, there's no such thing as sort of neutral uh, description, but, but very much make the fundamental assumptions uh, in their work uh, transparent. I think the point about that, if you have this book I mentioned that I think is absolutely beautiful is, that if you just somehow try to make explicit how you think about emotion, what the what is your fundamental ideas about like creation, about the, the nature of emotion, if you make that 
uh, explicit rather than saying you use a questionnaire or that you rely on this and that researcher, you actually help researchers immensely. So I think that's uh, that's somehow the improved version of, that does the social uh, part as well, but also actually uh, for outsiders give some of that reasoning and make it explicit. Um, thanks a lot for that presentation. I'm uh, very excited about the project. Um, you speak like there's a very clear boundary as to whether Faber is or is not using a theory, and partly that's to do with some of the def definitions you have in play. And one way that we could test a theory is the sort of model where it's the not even wrong kind of thing, um, where we are looking at kind of wrongness. Another way to look at theory it would be with something like a kind of common law tradition where a judge is making judgments such that um, they're drawing on past judges and so that future judges might judge them. When, when we've got something like a best paper in Kai, that's the Kai community is judged that these are the papers that most represent um, what is best. So um, there's a kind of internal sense that um, the people who are the best judges have judge these others to also be the best. And what we could then do, and I, I really like your paper with um, Eliza Meckler for doing this, is we can point out, we can make more explicit theories that were implicit in what we judge to be the best work. So it's not just that necessarily someone says, here's my theory, I'm now I'm applying it. Uh, there's, there's you, you, I, I haven't seen you talk about the fact that there's lots of very interesting work that shows, look, here's a good paper. Here's how actually all along, here's this theory that was operating within it. Yeah, I think that's a very good observation. And in particular, the, the very small part of me who is interested in technical HCI, it somehow seems to be an area which, which has this uh, wealth of systems. And only over time do we understand what, what they actually did and why they were clever. I think, uh, in a way, direct manipulation is an example of that, right? We had those systems way before we had, say, Snyderman's conceptualization of that in what AD or whatever three. Um, so, so somehow that it can build up and then sub subsequently, of a research area can build up and sub subsequently be be redescribed or reinterpreted or theorized, or whatever. Um, uh, so, I think that's a very sensible uh, suggestion. I think. In, uh, I think when I first began to to think about this, I wanted to to do um, I wanted to do a, I'm a big fan of fan of Mark Hasenthal, uh, but I don't really understand what this his user experience theory is saying. So I wanted to do a sort of a reconstruction of that just to get what on earth is it that he's saying because I I'm persuaded by it, but 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 the things that are will make it or break it. I continue to this day to be unsure about. So that would be a similar example. Right now I'm doing that for, I guess, oh my God, you want that paper, Maya, and that human computer integration. That, that's an example of something. I have no clue what they are talking about. And what I want to do with that is, so, and we're, actually, we're doing that now, we just take all the sentences where they say something substantial about human computer integration. We, we sort them, we classify them, and we try to reconstruct what's going on in that paper what's uh, what's the actual points that we can that's worth disagreeing with and what just happened to be a, a developing area where uh, where um, where you are explaining something in a way that may not be completely right so those are two different things i for me it makes sense to try to do exactly uh, exactly uh, that to uh, um, and and i think in particular for technical hi sometimes this things happens like uh, human computer integration and then we need to make sense of what it is and what the, the sort of substantial claims are and what's more accidental. So I think Speaking I agree. Friends. Speaking <laughs> of making friends. We are, we are so good friends that nothing can break our friendship. Just by the time, we're a little long, long time, but the conversation still got going well. But you can see how please do. Um, but we've got a couple more questions. Anyone else with a question? Yeah, after that, three questions. Okay, so we're probably looking around at the 10 to 15. But you're good, and there's no one at the door, so let's carry on. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was a great talk, and um, I think a sign of great talks is when, you know, sort of it, you're, you're provoked even 
you agree with a lot of it and then there are things that you don't disagree with. So I'm really struggling to form my question here. I think one one issue is, and as Anne pointed out, is, is, is the structure of Kai papers as well. But it's not necessarily that we don't work with theory. It's that it's not present in our literature as much as it might be. So for example, a PhD thesis, for example, mine is full of theory, but then when I wrote papers and, and in the review process, somehow the theory sort of filters down to little nuggets here and there, often in the discussion section. So is there, uh, is there a gap in terms of not the fact that we are not designing with theory, but we are not being able to write about it effectively? And theory is difficult, right? It's not just a lot of people. I think there is a problem even when theory is used because a lot of people have favorite theories. You sometimes can't figure out why they go for a particular theory because often a lot of them have overlapping constructs. Mm -hmm. So it's like you could be using a particular construct, but you've decided to use it within a particular theory, whereas it might be in five other theories which explain that behavior, not necessarily why it's instrumental in the design that you're, yeah. you're doing. So how do you think we can address that gap in terms of what we're doing and what we are writing about. Because I don't think that there is necessarily the fact that we do, all of us spend like years reading about all the theories that are written out there. But I still feel that there is a translation gap, which is what Anne was talking about as well. Like we have the, how do you translate from theory to design? I think we've all been there. I'm going to stop talking because otherwise I'm going to keep talking. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure how to answer. I mean, I think, you no, know, I mentioned cave and, and design portfolios, right? So I think one of the uh, ambitions there was to develop a, um, I guess, a format for something that was not there. And I think maybe some of those uh, reasonings along the way for particular designs, maybe there's a format that waits to be somehow discovered in, in documenting that and making that... Uh, explicit of course that reasoning might be good or terrible it, it could of course be subject to to interest to uh, a, a meta analysis of different kinds if it was uh, explicit so i guess maybe there's a maybe there's a, a thing to be done there i guess the other thing is that um i mean we have okay i'm sorry i'll just give a kai as an example again we have we have a, like a conventions around papers, some of which is completely hopeless, right? So why is it I want to read related work? So so if it's not like that, that is a very strange uh, section in many papers. I would prefer if you ditched that and wrote about how did you go from, I don't know, a particular theory on behavior change to a particular set of functions in, in uh, in a system and i think there are papers so now i for some reason ended up being negative i think there are papers in this corpus that are that do give that type of of uh, explanation I, it can be in the paper it can be in an appendix i think it's super exciting so so somehow i guess if we agree and believe that those types of reasoning are uh, reasonings are useful maybe we should make space for them in one way or the other um Uh, hi, Casper. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was it was great. I was here, and uh, as you went on through your arguments, I was feeling poked because I actually wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation in which I actually went out of the way to find a suitable thesis, a uh, suitable theory. Mm -hmm. I uh, tried to, I actually use it to explain the the research that we were doing. I actually used it to design it. I found a design method method that enabled me to apply the theory and extract knowledge to it, uh, establish a relational ontology with concepts, discuss it. And uh, so it was von Hippel's theory of user, of user innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I used it to explain how to design toolkits for uh, machine learning. And um, in the end, I discussed, and I, I actually had some interesting comments from uh, my uh, examiners in the thesis because they were not used to uh, see a doctoral thesis written with such theoretical engagement. Um, 
but so it uh, got you into trouble. Sorry, so it got you into trouble. <laughs> uh, it 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 was challenging, but I I managed to get out of it uh, very nicely, I think. Um, but I I think I agree with what Anne said about this problem of theory being more constrained in the HCI domain, because in even more contingent uh, domains like, for instance, information studies, which is also deals with uh, socio-technical systems. Yeah. There's a lot of use of tech uh, of theory, mm -hmm. and they even have like specific methods such as action design research, in which they uh, define a, a theoretical ingrained artifact, which is the object of design, mm -hmm. and they go on and use theory to to push design, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but I also thought that when you look at the broader picture of science um, and research in general, uh, there, there's an old an old uh, letter that was uh, written by Bernard uh, Farcher, which is called "Chaos in the Brickyard." Uh, I'm not sure if you your knowledge about it, no. but it it basically it sets a metaphor about academic researchers as builders of buildings. And uh, young junior scientists or researchers as brick makers. And he basically talks about the gap between the data that they produce and theory. And there's a gap that's becoming broader and broader because there's less buildings being built, which is theory, and more and more bricks being being produced. And uh, there's so, so many bricks that it's actually difficult to find the right bricks to build buildings or theory so i was wondering if what would be your commenting about that if there's like a broader problem in research if this is symptomatic of the heterogeneity in hci or uh, yeah okay that's a that's a good uh, that's a good question i don't know i it's not like i'm familiar with other fields actually <laughs> uh, but i guess it seems to me that there are definitely areas areas where as the amount of empirical data increases there's a much bigger attention to synthesis integration uh, structured reviews uh, meta-analysis or things like that in an attempt to somehow integrate what it is that we get from the brick layers or something uh, something uh, like that. Um, so I don't think that's, uh, I don't think reviewing and reviews and structured approach, approach to synthesizing and building theory from knowledge is particularly prevalent in, in HCI, but I don't sort of have the numbers. Then there's the other problem that, or the other just, uh, um, I guess, um, observation that HCI is a very diverse field and that's definitely, uh, that that's definitely true, and it it means that no, I didn't show you the, but I show you a list of theories, and there's a list of uh, of uh, of theories used at Kai Twenty Twenty One, which has an insanely long tail, uh, which is in itself uh, interesting, uh, because most of them uh, it sort of has a classic zip distribution, so most of them are ju just used once, which is also a little sort of weird to 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 think about that you have a theory that. That is only used uh, uh, once, but I think that speaks to the to the heterogeneity, and I guess um, uh, I guess maybe that makes it more difficult for a field like HCI. I think my point about pluralism of theory was that I that you could also think about it in another way, which was if you have a a field which is interested in both individual and social aspects of, of a particular phenomenon and both like uh, somehow interactive behavior close to a computer and sort of as it as it moves farther from it, you, you could think that we would spend more energy on integrating those perspectives. And I, I think that's a, that's a type of, of a theory that I wish we also uh, also had so somehow, a better, maybe you know this new spans of cognition thing going from I don't know biological uh, uh, adaptation to uh, social cultural integration that we had more that spanned that somehow or help us bridge that 
and right now it that's that's I don't know uh, social computing and this is a uh, interaction devices and maybe this is some neuroscience meets VR people but but not a whole lot of theory building development integration across of those I have zero idea if I actually answered your question but that was somehow just what I think, came I think to mind still I think they're really useful for making people more attuned to the the different aspects and the different importance and the, the value that working with a theory has. And I think that that might make a difference in the future for the field. Hmm. But maybe someone needs to formalize it as you're doing it. And, and very well. Thanks. Thank you. And on that note, let's thank our speaker one more time.